All right, so here we're looking at making decisions with multiple objectives. And we're going to explore an approach where you convert all of those objectives to a dimensionless score. Colloquially, sometimes called rate and weight, or more formally, perhaps multi-attribute value theory. Regardless of the name, it's a familiar situation. You've got a bunch of options, alternatives. You have multiple things that matter to you, which go by many names, objectives, metrics, attributes, and such. And which of these alternatives should you choose? We're going to take an all too familiar example, which is figuring out which college would be the best for you. So let's say we have a set of alternatives, and we're going to compare these over a set of different attributes. Which one is the best college? So this approach is in a category of approaches called compensatory approaches because it allows you to trade off success in one metric for weakness in another. Like maybe this school has better academics, but it also costs more, as an example. In another video, we talk about a way to do this where you convert all the data to its equivalence in a single metric, such as convert everything to cost. In this video, we're talking about a really commonly used approach, which is convert all data into a dimensionless unit. And the main point of this video is just to walk you through an example of how people tend to do this. So which college would be best for you? Here are our alternatives. A lot of schools on the East Coast in the US and the Southeast a little bit. And how do we know which attributes to compare them on? Well, this is just a super quick rundown on, we'll start by thinking about what are your objectives? You can build an objectives tree and work it all the way down to at the bottom part of that objectives tree to have metrics. Um, so a top level objective maybe is like, I want to go to a university where I can, yeah, I want to gain an education that will allow me to grow into someone that can make a significant contribution to society in a personally meaningful way. Okay, maybe that's the top level objective on your objectives tree. You drill that down to sub-objectives and sub-objectives there. And eventually, you'll kind of come down to metrics, right? Which are the things that you'll actually compare the different schools on. So let's imagine these are the attributes or metrics you end up with. You want to have tuition that's as low as possible. A size of a school, in this case, it's targeted around 12,000 people. Uh, maybe you want to have you know, a student-faculty ratio as small as possible, et cetera. You go out and you collect this data, and warning, this data is quite dated at this point to compare these different schools. Now, what do we need to do before we can start using these attributes to make comparisons? Well, right now they're all in different units, different scales. You can't just add these up, right? And so a very common first step in this approach is to normalize the variables. And if I go back to the prior screen, you can see tuition, you know, MIT is at $25,000. Uh, and I think that's the highest one on here with this old data. And the lowest one on here is Virginia Tech at 4638. When we go to the normalized scales, we see that MIT has a score of zero and Virginia Tech a score of one. When we normalize, all we're doing is we're taking the raw data and we're putting it on a scale from zero to one where zero is the worst alternative and one is the best alternative. There are lots of ways to normalize data. This just happens to be a common one. To break that down just for a minute, a little more graphically, here is the range of tuition from 25,000 to 4638. What we're going to do is just assign the worst value, in this case the highest tuition, a value of zero, and the best uh, value, in this case the lowest tuition, a 1 on the normalized scale. In between, we're just going to linearly interpolate between those values. When you're doing this, something that's important to take note of is that because the range of tuitions is 20362 it means that every one tuition dollar change is worth one over that range of a change in normalized value. So one twenty thousand three hundred and sixty seconds of a move on the normalized scale is one dollar move on the actual unnormalized dollars. You can see 
how that actually works for tuition. We already kind of have uh, explained this a little bit. Um, the uh, equation you can use for this is shown on the screen now. And just recognize that uh, for tuition, you know, and actually most of the ones in this example, lower is better. So your worst one is the biggest value and your best one is your lowest value. But there certainly can be examples where higher is better. In that case, your worst one is your lowest value and your best one is your highest value. So in this version of how to write the normalization equation, we just use worst and best so that it's um, applicable whether you're trying to maximize or minimize the given attribute or metric. All right, now, if you happen to be trying to normalize something that has a target value, remember we had a target value for the size of the university at 12,000, all you need to do is take the raw data and then find the distance from that target value first and then normalize there, where in that case, again, the smallest values in this case would be the best. So Georgia Tech is almost exactly at our target value. Uh, and so the difference from 12,000 is only 203 students. Whereas some other schools like Florida, really, really big, it's 22,000 away. So in this case, that 203 would be the best and the 22,060 would be the worst. So the zero on the normalized scale and normalized back with the same equation we talked about a minute ago. Here we have our complete table of normalized values. And a really common next step is to start looking at the relative worth of these different attributes. And people do that using weights. Weights, however, bring in a really interesting dynamic and are based on a concept we've already talked about, which is the marginal rate of substitution. And so in this case, you might ask yourself, how much more tuition would you pay for one lower value on the student to faculty ratio scale? And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I would pay, you know, uh, $200 extra for that. Or maybe it's $2,000 extra for that. Um, at the end of the day, weights do establish how much of one thing you're willing to give up for another of the different metrics or attributes that you're considering. It's exactly the same thing we did in the other video where we had apartments and we converted everything to cost. It's just we're doing it in a little bit different way. We create a weighted score where we multiply the weights by the normalized values and sum them up. And implicitly that does incorporate the trade-off of each metric with each other. When it gets down into the details of how that happens, we're gonna have another video coming up next about how to actually get the marginal rates and take those to obtain the weights. For here, just know that if you know the marginal rates of substitution, how much of one thing you're willing to trade off for another, and you know the range of each metric, then you can calculate the weights. And we'll show you how to do that, like I said, in the next video. So now we have our normalized values. Let's say we had our marginal rates and we calculated our weights based on those. And here are the weights that we have at the bottom of our screen. It's, it's typical practice to have the weights sum to one. Now all we do is we multiply the weights by the normalized values and sum them up for each school. All right, so here we are, we got our scores. For the given preferences of this decision maker, and the data data that we have, clearly UVA is the best choice. What do you know? But we're not done. This score of 0.86, you see it's 0.15 better than MIT, it looks like, which is the second placed one. What does that mean? Remember, these scores are dimensionless. These scores themselves essentially are meaningless to any person who's reviewing them. That said, even though the score may be meaningless, we went to all this work for good reason. There's a lot of value in trying to figure out for the top alternatives, which are in this case, UVA and MIT and maybe Duke, why are they the top alternatives and how are they different from each other? And we can do that by doing a little bit additional post analysis 
once we get to this stage. Several ways to do this. One is just to do some simple exploration, which I'll show you a couple examples of. And it's a whole other topic to think about doing a real deep sensitivity analysis to look at how stable your uh, scores are as you change uh, values such as weights or ratings that you aren't fully sure about. So a very uh, quick way to explore some strengths and weaknesses is just go across for uh, each school and look at places that it has really high values in its normalized scores or really low values in its normalized scores. In this case, uh, I was highlighting them based on whether it was higher than uh, more than uh, a certain distance above the average in terms of the standard deviation or a distance below the average in terms of the standard deviation. And what you can see for our top few schools here are MIT, Duke, and UVA. You see that UVA has a lot of green, doesn't have any weaknesses. MIT is pegging out, you know, really, really high on SATs and on uh, how many uh, sort of the student-faculty ratio and the reputation, but it's really struggling on some of the red marks here with like the tuition right here and according to how it's rated here the environment um, and then duke has some green parts but it has a tuition issue over here too as being a weakness so that's one way to do uh, one thing to do after you do your analysis is to really go in for the top candidates and see what does each one excel at and where does it struggle here's a rudimentary uh, plot i would say that shows some of the similar information graphically and this is the weighted scores broken down by each attribute. And one thing you can see here is that between MIT and UVA, it actually looks pretty similar with one big exception, this tuition block, where MIT essentially doesn't have it, it's so small. And because UVA's tuition is low, it does really well on the weighted score for tuition. And that really is largely the difference between the two. Um, you can also see some other differences where like the reputation of MIT based on this green bar is bigger than it is for UVA, but it's maybe not quite as drastic as that tuition difference that we saw uh, at the very bottom there. How do you present these kind of results to a stakeholder? Well, here's the things I would want to think about is um, consider the conditions under which you might select a certain alternative. For instance, after all this analysis, the outcome is not, hey, UVA scored the best, go there. It's more contextual than that. Um, you have a lot more information here than just being able to say that. What you might result with is say, well, you know, go to MIT for the academics. They really excel with student-faculty ratio and SAT scores and reputation. But that comes with a high in the dated values, 25K tuition and a lackluster environment. Go to UVA if you want about $20,000 a year lower tuition if you're in-state while having a really top environment without any big weaknesses at all. And in terms of why you might select Duke, well, you know, if you're out of state for UVA, uh, then maybe just go to Duke because it's a smaller school and it has a slight bump in academics over UVA. However, if you're an in-state student at UVA, you would want those things, plus you're willing to pay about 15K more per year. All right, so multi-attribute decisions like this are all around us from college rankings like we just saw, and you know there are magazines all around that have different rankings. Cities get ranked. Um, there's a massive study where uh, all the army bases were compared uh, using multi-attribute decisions to determine which ones to keep open, which ones to close. Football teams are ranked this way on polls, um, looking at massive expenditures, say, on transportation projects or other public works projects. And besides that, I'll even say, you know, it gets into high-tech industry. So here it says Facebook chooses maximum engagement over user safety. This is talking about their algorithm and how they were giving five times the points for a reaction on a post that used emoji compared to the reaction that just used a like. That implicitly is using this same concept of marginal rates to compare two different attributes, which one might be how many emojis were applied to a post, and the other attribute is how many likes were applied to the post. 
So this is really their core algorithm of their business is based around an approach not dissimilar from what you just saw. It has the same underpinnings to it, but it gets like the cool name algorithm or data science you know, or machine learning or something like that. When ultimately what's happening is it's looking at, we have multiple attributes. We're trying to rank different posts based on those attributes. And we're trying to do it in a way that represents the marginal rate um, of, of trade between those different attributes. What well, we know this approach is used heavily and normalization and weighting are at the center of this approach. One of the biggest misuses of multi-attribute value theory or rate and weight is to assume that if metric A has a bigger weight than metric B, then metric A is more important than metric B. Come back next time to learn why a bigger weight for metric A than metric B does not mean that metric A is more important than that metric B. See you then.